that. Hi everyone, my name is Samir. I am a final year who has an interest in internal medicine. My slides are very text heavy because I'm not going to go through all of it and you can read lots of stuff at home. For those who've downloaded, I've added like a hundred slides of just random stuff they think is important for you to know but isn't on the list of topics Stacey gave me today. Um, you'll get lots of advice today about how to do well at the end of the year. My advice is that the PEDS exam is the most stupid exam you'll ever do. It has an incredibly poor correlation, I think, with, <clears throat> with your understanding of actual PEDS, but it is also the easiest exam to get marks on. It's so much easier to get one PEDS mark than a mark on women's, where you're literally just guessing from A to M and you have no idea what the answer is. So the PEDS exam is dumb. Rupert Hines has a, a questionable understanding of non-gastroenterology, but... <laughs> Compared to every other exam, it is the one where you'll feel most bad when you miss easy marks. So spend some time on it, go through all the, the buzzwords really that other people have already set up for you, and that'll at least get you some extra points towards your Z score. These are the topics Stacey wants me to go through. Um, I might not get to encopresis and enuresis, mainly because it's boring and there's also an excellent fact sheet on the Muppets website that Stacey mentioned as well. So, Everyone gets reflux. Probably most of you here have at some point had reflux. Babies have a large variety of natural factors as listed that predispose them to having greater esophageal dysmotility than the usual person. Some babies will feed and they'll be completely well. Some babies will feed, but they'll have some air in their tummy or their esophagus that gets displaced by the milk as it goes down. That air, just in the same way that there's air being displaced when you draw up a saline into a cannula, has to come out somewhere and some babies will immediately do something called positing. The moment they feed, they'll immediately burp up a little bit of milk. That is fine. A parent is unlikely to present to the GP or pediatrician because of positing. Some children do a little bit worse though. The milk probably makes its way at least into the lower third of the esophagus or into the stomach. And then because of things like an obtuse angle of hiss, which none of you remember from third year, things like being vaguely horizontal for most of their life, they'll have some reflux. In some children, it's a disease. And that's kind of where the money is in pediatrics. So to go up from normal reflux to disease, there's a large number of things that can sort of add that extra little bit that makes it pathological. Those are broadly summarized as upper respiratory tract and lower respiratory tract symptoms, any blood in the vomit, and any weight gain, sleep issues, and feeding problems. But more easily, what I think you guys should ask in your OSCE is, when he refluxes, what does he actually do? Because the reflux might be normal, but he might do things like stop breathing. He might sometimes do this weird shaking, which is part of the apparent life-threatening events phenomenon. But anything sort of weird happening while a child is actively refluxing will probably suggest that this child has a disease. The reason we care is because they eventually will often either fail to thrive or fail to gain weight appropriately, or they'll suffer actual long-term disease of their esophagus. If you have untreated gourd with a D, your predisposition to things like eosinophilic esophagitis in the future is much higher, and that is worth treating. There's also this thing called Sandifer syndrome. You might see it um, pretty much only in, as I flag, the stupid peds exam. It's when they reflux, they subsequently develop opisthotonic neck posturing. So the neck kind of twists sort of right after they've refluxed. It's to do with irritation of nerves that are very close to the esophagus, because in kids, everything is very small and close together. That is also a sign of disease. So if a child comes in and you ask all of your questions, or you just ask the ones I said, upper respiratory, lower respiratory tract, weight gain, blood, et cetera, and there's nothing really there, you don't need to do anything. All the mum should continue to do is feed the child as usual. And sometimes if there's sort of the weights tapering off without being particularly problematic, maybe just measure your baby's weight a bit more often. Just see the GP and they'll record it into one of those little books. In any circumstance where you do transcend into a disease state, there are lots of things that we can do, and all of them are incredibly unpleasant for children. So even in kids who do have disease, often a pediatrician will say, we'll do these if we can't fix it through our sort of empiric therapies. One of the things that in all of these we do in adults as well, but to a lesser extent. So 24-hour esophageal pH monitoring, where we put what is effectively a very, very thin NG wire down into the distal third of the esophagus and measure its pH over about two to three days, typically. You put it in, the kid goes home with it, and you look for massive decreases in that pH, so increased acidity within the esophagus to look for a sign of pathological disease. There are barium swallows, which you'll know about, endoscopy, which is very, very difficult in children who have an incredibly complex soft palate 
for, from an anatomical perspective. It can also just give them nuclear food and just scans and see where that food's going at two hours, four hours, and typically six hours after they've eaten it. That's typically just like irradiated milk, really, but it's not meant to cause too much harm to the child. So if it is just normal reflux, you don't really have to change what the child's eating. If they're currently breastfed, you don't need to transfer them to A2 milk or whatever the sponsor of this thing is. But typically they'll be okay. And the numbers are here. It's worth knowing the numbers. You know, in a year and a half, most children will be fine. And even at three months, the vast majority of children will have grown out of it. If a child doesn't grow out of it and they're doing it at two years, at some point they'll eventually start to compromise their weight gain and you'll eventually empirically initiate disease management. If there is some sort of disease going on, you know, acne is that sort of thing, what we tend to do is make the baby prone, so lying on their stomach at a 30 degree elevation. That sort of is meant to, it's meant to, I guess, straighten out your esophagus, but as well as your oropharynx and make it a bit harder for the food to immediately come out. Sometimes after feeding a child, we'll keep them completely upright or on left lateral. Left lateral is flagged in a lot of peds things, but there's incredibly shitty evidence for it. And finally, sometimes you'll give them more food, but less food and sorry, more frequent feeds of less food and you add thickeners. You can add curry care, um, there's rice cereals that you can add. Um, my parents did this for me because I had this as a kid and they just mixed in um, starch into my food, which I think was a bad dietary decision, but it's something that will also work and you'll see done in Southeast Asian communities. Um, if the kid's not being breastfed, you can use firm nipples at smaller outlets. Uh, people say it, it doesn't physiologically make sense, but if you want to say it in your OSCE, you won't be wrong. So sometimes it's really bad though. Sometimes when the kid has gourd, they have things like epistodonic neck posturing, or it looks like they're about to die very briefly in an apparent life-threatening event. In these situations, ranitidine has the safest evidence and then omeprazole or esomeprazole. Sorry, I've copied the American one. Um, both of them have similar efficacy, but ranitidine is meant to have lower long-term effects in things like bone density and that sort of stuff that's important in children. You can also simply coat the esophagus and gaviscon. That is really safe for most kids and is really effective, but it's very poorly tolerated. In about 30 to 40% of kids, if you just give them Gaviscon, which like some of your dads and mums might take, um, it'll often just immediately make them vomit. And that's obviously a bad outcome as well. If they're not eating at all, if their growth is really dropping off, you could do NGT feeds. And at that point, you'll probably want a pediatrician to properly assess them. And as your last resort, you can do a Nissen fund application, which is something we in adults do for things like hiatal hernias and other diseases. Um, if they've got Down syndrome, or if they have any other number of those severely neurologically compromising infant syndromes, you can sometimes just skip the entire esophagus and put a gastrostomy tube in. Um, obviously, those children have incredibly poor prognoses and you're unlikely to be seeing them unless you're at the children's on gastro. So the next topic was gastroenteritis. I'm going through quite quickly uh, put your hand up very widely or just even stand up if you have questions. So a lot of gastroenteritis in children is very similar to adults. Your most causative agents are slightly different. So it's norovirus and campylobacter. And typically they'll present in a similar way. They'll have diarrhea, even if they're not eating food. So indicative of a secretory diarrhea, as opposed to one that's osmotic. They'll often have abdominal pain and they'll have dehydration. So an important thing that you want to work out immediately is does the kid have dysentery? Because the reality is, if you're in GP land, you can manage peds, gastroenteritis. If you're in the ED, you can often send a gastro kid home after a brief stint and short stay. But the moment they have dysentery, so blood in the stool, they need a gastro review. They might even need the surgeons, depending how that bowel's going. So many of you will have had gastroenteritis, ongoing diarrhea at some point in the past. And eventually, some of you will have had little blood on wiping when you, because you're wiping repeatedly throughout the day to clean your bowels and many children will have blood on the paper as part of their presentation. The mum will be really worried, he's pooing blood, but the blood in dysentery is proper hematochesia. It's mixed in, it's the sort of blood you get from a right-sided clonic cancer or like a small intestinal bleed. So that's more severe. Some important differentials are things like urinary tract infections, appendicitis, the broadest surgical acute abdomen, which Ben will talk about later. And the good thing is that in pediatrics, the younger they get, the more precipitously they can fall off, which is a bad thing, but the more vague their presentations are. So typically, if a kid comes in with uh, gastroenteritis, unless it's very clear, you're probably going to stick their urine anyway. You're probably going to poke their belly and think about a surgical cause. 
Um, there are some red flags. I'll talk about those later. But things like bilious vomit is obviously a severe sign that maybe there might be some sort of ileus or obstruction going on. So I've put this in here mainly because I had it in my third year notes and I think it's a reasonable table. I don't think this will come up in the OSCEs, but this sort of thing might come up in the EMQs. Particular risk factors. I remember when I did fourth year exams, there's lots of stuff about John went to Russia and now he has diarrhea. What's the cause? And he was silly, but it's worth having a broad understanding of all of these and the classic Monash associated risk factors with these. Something that you might want to look into a little bit more, Ben might cover it because it eventually becomes surgical, is EHEC or enterohemorrhagic E. coli, which is where you have a dysentery-like presentation. It's not really dysentery because the blood isn't coming from the, I guess, the stool itself. It's more the bowel is actively dying. So that stops being dysentery and starts being enterohemorrhagic disease. Um, so I've got a couple of slides there. And then moving on. So if a kid comes in with gastro to PZD or GP, you often don't have to do anything. If they're very dehydrated to the point they're cold, clammy, they're shut down, you'll often initiate sepsis protocols. It's really important in your OSCEs to have an incredibly low threshold for being this child might be septic. There's an OSCE that they no longer run from about 2014, where there was a kid who was kind of ill and the only positive finding was an inf like a I uh, guess an injected tympanic membrane. Some of you might have seen this OSCE. That is an injected tympanic membrane to a lot of people, to about 70% of people, suggested that the child had otitis media. The child was septic and the tympanic membrane was inflamed because when you're septic, everything gets shit. It's important to have a very low threshold. Even if you think the kid does have gastro, but they might be septic from it, you go for your life with all the investigations. In some kids who aren't that sick, you will do a fecal sample. So significant pain, very unwell if they have dysentery, you'll want a bit of the poo. Um, it's well noted that the poo must actually be unformed for any path lab pretty much in Victoria to actually test it. If the child is unwell with gastro and is recovering and is having formed stools, most path labs will simply reject it unless you call them otherwise. Sometimes you'll want to assess things like their hemodynamic status and their electrolytes. So a classic Monash thing and a real thing is, I guess, doughy skin. So not necessarily a lack of skin turgor, but the skin is sort of thick and pliable and it's, significant, it's uh, indicative of a very severe hyponatremia, which can happen. So anything about doughy skin in an OSCE, it's probably panic, get lots of help. Some parents uh, haven't grasped the concept of ORS, which is very reasonable. That was the main thing to say. But some of them will just give their child a huge amount of water. Some of them will give their children huge amounts of like soft drinks, like lemonade, which is great for the kid in the short term, but they'll it'll often throw off their electrolytes. So even if a kid is relatively well, if mom's like, yeah, I've been giving him like liters and liters of water, you'll still want to do a urine electrolyte and creatinine to make sure the mom hasn't just caused a tiny bit of kidney failure. If they have an ileostomy, so they're post-surgical, the losses you can have from an ileostomy tend to be super duper massive. So these kids are at massive risk of dehydration. If they're immunocompromised or have otherwise lost huge amounts, you'll also probably do some tests for the same reason. So the big management of gastroenteritis is rehydration. Uh, ben wanted to take that. He messaged me, he's like, I want to teach rehydration, so fine. Um, what you'll tend to do though, is you'll often analgese. Does anyone know the pediatric panadol dose? Anyone? Okay, so there are probably three doses you should go home after this gastro talk and look up. One is the pediatric antiemetic dose. So metoclopramide is relatively safe in most kids and on Dantotron, although Dantotron causes constipation, which we like to avoid. Uh, Panadol is probably another one. And ibuprofen. When, if you've done PZD, you'll see them, they give out ibuprofen and Panadol like, like candy in kids because they're safe at the appropriate doses. You should probably look them up to know what they are. So you can give on Dantotron, it does cause constipation, so they need to be relatively big to tolerate that constipative effect. Um, rehydration, Benel cover. There are antibiotics that you can give if it's dysentery. My tables include this particular antibiotics that you'd like to use, but you often won't need to know which ones. And typically a mix of uh, norfloxacin or ciprofloxacin and metronidazole will probably cover all of your dysenteric antibiotics. Um, something I took from my GP notes is that if the kid gets gastro often and they're traveling to India or somewhere where you often get gastro, there are traveler's kits you can have and read about later. And after you get gastro, because you have significant damage to your villi, which is where your lactase lives, often children can be sort of temporarily lactose intolerant. 
that's unlikely to be a presentation in an OSCE, but it's something that if you have a gastro OSCE, you can warn the parents about. If your child isn't tolerating milk, like you know, breast milk or cereal milk or whatever, as well as they usually do, don't be too panicked. Wait at least two to three days before you really worry and start to bring them into hospital. Unless, of course, they're not eating anything at all, in which case normal pediatric concerns apply. So there's another separate thing that is different to a lactose intolerance, which is when you have an intolerance to cow's milk protein. I looked up the name of the protein and it's a very long scientific name, so I don't remember, but it's an important differential for gastro, but it's important differential also for pediatric pellagra. Does anyone know what pellagra is? About three quarters of you will have done GP. Anyone? Yep, so pellagra is a vitamin deficiency. Does that help? B3. So niacin deficiency in adults is pellagra, dermatitis, diarrhea, and then a sort of an acute psychiatric disturbance, dementia. Some kids will have pellagra. If they're from poor countries, if they are refugees and other groups that are associated with higher risk of malnutrition, there'll be kids who come in with the vitamin deficiencies you've studied in pediatrics. This is not one of those. It's much easier to treat. You just give them a particular amino acid in their milk and they do fine. And often they get better anyway. So does anyone know what the picture on the left is? I can give you the clinical context of a kid who often has loose bowels and is not putting on weight. It's a very, it's from like Dermnet. It's like a classic picture. Any ideas? I will add on some clinical information. Um, there's a family history of autoimmune thyroid disease and diabetes type one. Picture on, picture on the left. Yes, that side. Anyone? Yes, denotitis hepatiformis. Excellent. So this is a classical, but not that common finding in children with untreated celiac disease. On the right, I've got another picture that happens if you have untreated celiac disease for a longer time. If, really, if your parents are really not on the ball about the fact that every time you have bread, you shit yourself. Any ideas? Okay, so celiac disease is a disease that is uncomfortable to have. I have friends with celiac. And they're like, it sucks. And I'm like, sure, I don't care. But more importantly, celiac disease is associated with a wide range of medical comorbidities that get progressively worse the, more long, the longer it isn't treated. This isn't a worry in a 40-year-old lady who develops celiac disease, which is another one of your spike risk factor groups. In children, though, for every, like, well, effectively, for every day of untreated celiac, most of the evidence suggests that even if you eventually treat the celiac, Things like having, uh, there's a specific T-cell lymphoma, long-term autoimmune disease, osteoporosis, still have a higher risk ratio of occurring. That last one I flagged was bilateral occipital calcifications, which are sort of caused by a celiac-induced folate deficiency that causes AVMs at the back of the brain that cause a lot of seizures. So even if you eventually treat them, if you have sort of let them go for a couple of years, they're at a higher lifetime risk of a lot of the associated complications. But celiac disease is an autoimmune small intestinal enteritis. It's triggered by gliadin, which is in wheat, rye, and barley. It's not technically in oats, although oats has some sort of particular protein that there's a decent amount of cross-reactivity, so we avoid oats. You will probably need to know it's associated with HLA, DQ2, and 8, but also with Downs, it's also, um, Downs Williams, and Turner's. And these children fail to thrive, they lose weight, it is uncomfortable to have steatorrhea, diarrhea, and bloating. And in longer term cases, they start getting ulcers in their mouth, uh, buttocks wasting, and dermatitis hepatiformis. This picture has probably both. It's very difficult to get a nice sort of top view approach of someone's butt on Dermnet, but that's probably a butt that hasn't got the, the perkiness that a butt of a child should have. So. There are lots of tests that we will do. You'll need to know all of these tests off by heart for Rupert. Um, but when a kid presents with query celiac, you need to do a full blood, UEC, CMP, all of these things that you can lose in your stool because they're not being absorbed sufficiently. And some antibodies in particular, so anti-TTG, gliadin, and alpha endomysial antibody of IgA. The best are anti-TTG and anti-gliadin. The reason that we do alpha endomysial antibody of IgA is because if that's still positive, we're probably still gonna treat that kid as if they have celiac and consider them for an empirical trial of non-gluten and probably scope them as well. So alpha endomysial also has some associations with, have I written down here? Yeah, with primary biliary cirrhosis or primary biliary cholangitis, which is something that might prompt us to have a quick squeeze at the child's biliary tree as well. 
you can do actual tests on the poo. So in the same way that you can test pancreatitis for free flat globule tests because the fat isn't being effectively used and they have steatorrhea as well, you can do a similar test in celiac disease kids. It's probably a very low yield, but you can say it. But the way we diagnose is we actually just tell them don't eat any gluten. We give them a long list of food to avoid, four to six weeks, and we scope them. So even if they start to have a symptomatic benefit, unless the parents are particularly overprotective, we will scope them, try to get to the distal duo or jedge. Often you can't get to the jedge. If any of you have done third year scopes, it's very difficult to get to like the middle of the small intestine. So often we'll just get duodenal biopsies, which are still very sensitive and specific. And the macroscopic and histological findings are very similar to what you would have learned last year in your extensive pathology teaching. So the management of celiac then is pretty simple. So you just tell them to stop eating gluten. You want to refer them to a gastroenterologist, mainly because the gastroenterologist is able to do sort of, there are oral treatments, there are oral like immunomodulators that you can do. And it's probably worth having a gastro follow-up just to be monitoring all of things like B12, folate and vitamin D effectively. That's a bit much to expect a GP to do in like a 15 minute visit. Um, so you want to monitor things like their antibody levels, their iron and folate. And also there's some evidence that every year they should get a thyroid panel with antibodies and a diabetes screen. So typically just a HbA1c. Um, some in kids as well, you sometimes do a fasting. I don't know if Rupert actually likes that. Um, but there's a decent amount of evidence in fairly reputable journals. Um, the dermatitis epidermis is treated with dapsone cream. You'll have come across dapsone cream in dermatology. Does anyone know what it is? Dapsone? Has anyone heard of dapsone before? Okay, so dapsone cream is actually an antibiotic. So as you sort of go up the years, a lot of your antibiotics, things like doxycycline, uh, macrolides, like azithromycin, stop being used for antibiotic properties, but start being used for anti-inflammatory reasons. That's the case here. So this is a really busy slide. We're moving briefly away from the tummy towards the kidneys. Um, I'm not gonna go through this. You guys have these slides and you can refer to them as I go on later. So urinary tract infections are common in children. Cystitis is obviously more common than pyelonephritis, which is more common than a full-blown urosepsis. About some evidence saying half of the children who have a UTI in childhood have structural abnormalities. Those studies probably looked at children with atypical and recurrent UTIs though. So it's probably worth being able to distinguish an atypical UTI, so the severity of their illness, no response to preliminary empiric antibiotic therapy, anything that's not E. coli is immediately weird. And if they have you know, abnormal bladder ureteric pathology, or if they've actually had an AKI or a CKD from their UTI. There are also people with recurrent UTIs. This becomes important later when we think about imaging them as per Rupert. So in kids, as I flagged before, a lot of presentations can be vague. Often a child will be non-specifically unwell with lethargy and irritability, and then they become septic. Sometimes a parent will be able to tell that there's hematuria or incredibly offensive urine. It's difficult though, because a child with a UTI is often a dehydrated child as well. And if you've seen dehydrated urine in a nappy, that nappy often is like orangey urine. It's often very foul smelling anyway, as a consequence of the AKI, as opposed to the, I guess, the pyuria. In older children and adults, you have the symptoms you expect of an adult. In older children, adolescents, sorry. Sometimes they can restart enuresis, so sort of uh, incontinence at times that would not be suspected. And it's always worth just considering whether or not this is a post-sexual abuse thing. Not important in your OSCEs, but potentially important in real life. I think all, nearly every hospital system except the Alfred will possibly send you to a rural site where you'll be managing pediatric ED. So in your examination or in your history, you wanna know about their voiding history, abdominal masses, constipation, any genitalia, if they're known to have things like vesicourteric reflux. And the most common organism is going to be Klebsiella and we treat appropriately sorry, is E. coli. If they have Klebsiella or Proteus or Pseudomonas, that is firstly an immediate atypical UTI and requires further investigation, but also is suggestive of long-term risks of things like stones and urinary tract abnormalities. So why a child has a UTI is an important question. So if they might have urethral valves or phimosis or hygiene, those are high risk factors. To investigate for urethral valves, the easiest way to ask is ask the mum or ask the dad after they urinate, do they sort of just continue leaking? 
Typically, the leaking is only for about five to 10 minutes, but that suggests there's a valve that has briefly stopped some of the urine and then has opened again to allow the rest of the urine to pass. Um, if some kids have gone to all their morphology screening, you'll hopefully have caught any big urinary tract or renal abnormalities, but you can also just ask if there was any small amount of fluid in the womb at the time of pregnancy. Vulvitis and constipation are easy to ask for. A neuropathic bladder child is someone who's likely to void very infrequently and voiding incredibly large amounts. It's because the blood is getting very, very, very big because it's neuropathic or neurogenic. And then eventually it will contract, mainly due to a muscular reflex as opposed to one managed by your sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. And you ask if their kid has some immunodeficiency. Most parents will hopefully know. So as I flagged, kids with UTIs go into sepsis. Again, have a really low threshold for investigating sepsis. Um, does this slide turn out okay? Yeah, so I got this from, I don't know, some book, and it kind of tells you all the different ways you can catch urine. This might come up actually on your EMQ, which, which thing is appropriate. As you can see, a lot of them, as you get further and further away from a suprapubic aspirate, they become less effective and less safe. Most of the time when we're doing an MSU or a clean catch, it's because the parent doesn't want a suprapubic aspirate or because the child is old enough that we can tell them what to do and they'll follow instructions. A catheter sample is very rarely taken. A catheter is actually more invasive than an aspirate. If you've seen an aspirate, like you guys could easily do an aspirate, even if you might suck at cannulas. You just wipe it, stick a needle in and pull it out. It, you don't even have to do it sterile, actually. I think you just wear sterile gloves. Anyway, so here's a more simple one. So as flagged, if the child is able to do things, they can void on request, you do an MSU, a clean catch is a bit more tolerable, but if they're septic, you skip it, you do an SPA because that'll actually get you the organism of choice. So Rupert says all children less than three months must get imaging if they have a UTI. Uh, the evidence suggests that the people who receive imaging are those with atypical UTIs, so not responding to treatment, those other criteria I flagged before. If you're male and less than three months, if you're having recurrent UTIs, and if you've had it less than six months, we'll probably ultrasound you at some point, although we won't ultrasound you, you know, the next day while you're still admitted. If they suspect there's an obstruction, you use a micturating cystourethrogram. One of the previous slides explained in detail what that was. And if there's ongoing renal concerns, in particular if they've had an episode of pilo and their EGFR is not bouncing back the way it should be, you'll probably do a DMSA. And again, the previous slide flagged with those well. So this is an MCUG of a child with bilateral vesicourinary reflux. What you can see is that when most of the urine is in the bladder, you really should have empty ureters. These ureters are firstly not empty and B are significantly dilated. You can also see some dilation in particular of the right calluses of the pelvis of the pelvis of the kidney a lot more than the left but this is a bilateral problem and here this is a DMSA scan. So this is a scan of a kid who's probably had pilo or urosepsis maybe in both kidneys and the left upper pole so I mean this part is significantly inactive. So that's a lot of scar tissue. This is a CKD kid going to grow up and continuing to probably develop chronic kidney disease. So the way you manage it, firstly, um, why have I highlighted the R? What does the R stand for in doctors ABCD? Responsiveness. Oh yeah, sure. I think I meant recognize. I think the first thing in the management of UTI is to importantly recognize it. And if they're less than six months and they suspect a UTI or if they're very ill, just transfer them. A lot of your OSCEs will have you in a rural hospital, have again, a very low threshold for transferring. They might need sepsis. ETG suggests to use trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole, so Bactrim or Clotrimotazole as your empiric therapies. The rest become more broad spectrum and that increases your rates of C. diff and peds, which is really hard to treat. They don't respond well to things like oral metronidazole and often require vancomycin instead, which has its own side effects. If the pathogen is pseudomonas, that kid needs to be fully investigated, but use norfloxacin. And in pilo, luckily, you just use the same treatments as adults. So in pilo or in a child who is, or in an adult who has urosepsis, you use gent and amoxy, and it's the same thing in children, mainly because of a lack of evidence telling us what to do. So after a child has had a UTI, given that maybe they've got something wrong with them from a ureteric or bladder pathology, they're likely going to get it again. So it's important to give them lots of fluid, make sure that they're regularly voiding. Some parents have to tell their children to do this. 
you know, if you've gone to the bathroom, go again to the bathroom to make sure you're really emptying out that bladder. And in particular for female infants, it's important to manage their hygiene. If they have a dirty nappy, you change it as soon as you can. You don't wait around. If they've got constipation as a cause, you'll, need, you'll probably need a pediatric review, but things like high fluid intake, stool softeners are often safe. And there's shitty evidence really for probiotic circumcision and antibiotic prophylaxis in most patients. Um, I don't know, Rupert has said different things in different shoots about these. But in some children who have severe VUR, it is reasonable to do things like ongoing Bactrim, although noting that it's probably going to cause long-term local resistance. So vesicourouretaric reflux is a sort of a surgical problem, but Ben got me to do it. Um, so it's a developmental anomaly of the vesicourouretaric junctions. So what normally happens is your bladder is a large ball. It is very muscular and your ureters enter at an angle. That means the ureters spend a lot of time going in between that bladder wall. That means that when they contract, there's actually quite a lot of muscle on either side of that ureter to really close it off to make sure there's no urine going up when the urine's meant to be going down. In VUR, they tend to enter at a perpendicular angle, so there's much less of a sphincter that's closing off those ureters incredibly quickly. That leads to the urine flowing upwards and dilatation and scarring is flagged. It's more common in women or in female children, and the causes can include things like family associations, other kidney pathologies, and I've listed all of them with a bit of detail at the end of the slides. And it can also happen if you've got things like neuropathic bladders and things like posterior urethral valves tend to be additionally associated with VUR. So the severity varies quite a lot. I've got a picture of mild, where there's not much sort of dilatation of the pelvic calluses, and I've got one that's severe, and that's a kidney that's obviously gonna be very unhealthy. So if it's really mild, typically there's not much that's there. There's a bit of an increased risk of pyelonephritis, even for mild reflux, but often they'll kind of get better. As, as they grow, their bladder tends to actually grow disproportionate size-wise to, to the diameter of your ureters. So you end up getting just enough muscle that it's not really a problem in adulthood. But in children with severe VUR, the big trouble is you're gonna knock off a lot of their kidney function before they've even had an opportunity to like get diabetes and smoke and drink and that sort of stuff. So they can present as I flagged as recurrent UTI, pyelo presentations, and your differentials tend to be image dependent. You're not really gonna work out if there's a urethral prolapse on physical exam, you're gonna have to image them with an MCUG. So your key investigations are flagged. There's nothing really surprising here. The, if they've got VUR, you do need to actually look at their urine via MSU or a suprapubic aspirate. But as flagged, most get better. Most don't need antibiotic prophylaxis, but some do, and all of them will need that sort of behavioral and lifestyle management that I discussed earlier. So here's a question for all of you guys. A kid comes in, they're puffy. Their eyelids are puffy, their scrotum is puffy, a very classic place for a kid to get puffy, and their legs are puffy. What are some reasons why a child might be puffy? This is a super, like, oskiable station. Heart failure is great. Next, anyone else? Nephrotic syndrome is great, and it's the answer because you guys have the slides. Anything else? Sorry? Uh, yeah, sure. Not a common cause, but a worthwhile cause. Doesn't tend to cause like anastarchus disease, tends to cause a bit more lower limb specifically, but very reasonable. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Good. Yeah, liver failures, all your failures cause it. Yeah, that's most of them. So obesity, you know, some kids are just puffy because they're fat. Um, heart failure, where a lot of your adult signs are also visible. Noting that in a child with heart failure, they're nearly always going to have their flag with reflux. They have very horizontal lifestyles. So you're not looking at the legs, you're really looking at, you're palpating the spine and feeling puffiness over the spine. Liver failure, anaphylaxis, nephrotic and nephritic syndrome also causes edema. And lots of things where you might be losing protein because of an enteritis. So that's things like, you know, cancer, Zollinger-Ellison from third year, celiac disease. There's a list there. They're interesting to Wikipedia and then forget about immediately. So nephrotic syndrome in kids tends to be just minimal change disease. It's about 85% compared to about 40% in adults. So the foot processes, not food processes, um, have become effaced, which means they stop being an effective barrier to the loss of protein. All protein, not just albumin, even though that's one we're key measuring. 
tends to happen in children less than four. If someone's seven or eight and starts having nephrotic syndrome, you will need to probably investigate for one of those more nefarious causes. Um, they're mostly also responsive to steroids. Things like focal, ooh, focal scleral, mm, focal segmental glomerular sclerosis is not responsive to steroids and you might need to biopsy a kid who's got nephrotic syndrome that isn't responding. And they're also non-idiopathic causes. So someone mentioned HSP earlier, but things like SLE, again, it sucked to have that as a kid are important. So the presentation of nephrotic syndrome is hypovolemia and AKI in most cases. They'll come in puffy and they'll come in not making urine and they'll come in incredibly sick or on the way to incredibly sick. They can also present though as a consequence of their protein loss. So they lose proteins that are important to the clotting cascade. I have seen one kid with nephrotic syndrome, he presented with a stroke. This is at neuro at the children's here, which is a really sucky and unlucky way to present. They can also present with recurrent and severe infections because they lose IgG. Often they might have some of those hypercholesterolemic signs that you see in adult patients. They can present as hyperthyroidism, vitamin D deficient. They can present as just sort of tired and pale and useless because of an iron deficiency anemia or just not growing. So the clinical signs that are earliest is periorbital edema on waking. After you get periorbital, you get scrotal, vulval, leg, ankle, ascites, and then pool effusions in that order. If a child is very upright, sometimes it changes and leg happens a bit faster, but typically your scrotum and vulva, because there's nowhere for that fluid to go from down, because there's no anatomy directly below, means they tend to get sick very fast. The symptoms of intravascular depletion you've probably thought about before, but things like cramping, dizziness, peripherally being shut down and tachycardic, and they can present, as I flagged, frankly, with cellulitis or with thrombosis. So the tests that you do, so in the ED, any of you can do a urine dipstick, the same considerations apply in terms of getting a clean urine. But in this sort of case, you don't really care so much about a potential organism unless you suspect a UTI. So often we're not doing suprapubic aspirates. Full bloods and ESR, because the ESR is an indicator of sort of kidney death, uh, UEC, LFTs, their lipids, and you really need to look for the cause. Even though the vast majority of kids are going to be, you know, one off minimal change or maybe a two or three off minimal change, you do need to run all of these tests and the Royal Children's recommends them, even if they don't do them all the time, looking for potential causes of other nephrotic syndromes. So malaria, varicella, hepatitis B, if they just had a strep throat, be very worried you're looking at an nephritic syndrome as opposed to a nephrotic one, things like complement and an ANA. In the urine, there are additional biochemical tests that you'll perform, they're listed there. Um, we don't tend to biopsy these children even if they've got fairly severe nephrotic disease because of the damage nephrotic syndrome does to your clotting cascade factors. So while nephrotic syndrome makes you more likely to clot and therefore I guess more safe to actually biopsy, you don't want to biopsy someone who's going to bleed to death. Um, typically with a pediatric renal biopsy, there's a quite a lot of blood that will naturally go into the renal capsule. And if that clots off versus being resorbed, it causes long-term chronic kidney disease. So we tend to not do a biopsy either. So there are indications and instructions for what you do if you admit. They go under OPRA, like, you know, you've got nephrotic syndrome. So do you, all of you have nephrotic syndrome. So you admit, sorry, you admit, you get some help because you don't know what you're doing because you're an intern. Um, if they have edema, the way you treat that is you don't have to salt restrict, really. Like, it's kind of hard to remove salt from normal food. But you don't add it. You make sure you're measuring their fluid balance, urine dipsticks, PRED and phenoxymethylpalacillin. PRED will fix the problem. Phenoxy will stop them from getting cellulitis and dying. Ranitidine. Does anyone know why we give the ranitidine? Because of the PRED. Excellent. So prednisolone causes the gastritis. You don't want to have to have six days into admission, a child who's clinically getting better, but then starts having abdominal pain. Because then you're worried about things like spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, and you want to eliminate that from differential. We tend to give aspirin, but not heparin, often because its safety profile in kids isn't that well evidenced. And we'll tell the family that it often get better, it might come back, just let us know, that sort of thing. And if it's refractory, we start doing things like frusamide, IV albumin, um, ACE inhibitors and NSAIDs sometimes help, and in worst cases, IVIG or plasma exchange. If your kid's getting any of those last couple, they're unlikely to respond and probably don't have nephrotic syndrome. So I'm, I was meant to finish at 9.45. Is Stacey still here or is she just hanging around outside? Another five, yeah. So anuresis is 
daytime incontinence of people over the age of three and five. As I flagged, there are nice, prettier looking sheets on the Muppets website. But it's important to not just think that the child is just weighing themselves during the day, because there are important concerns. And this is a reasonable ask you to test your sort of diagnostic threshold. They could have a UTI causing an overactive bladder. They could have infrequent voiding because they're just like, you know, too busy playing with their friends at school and don't want to pee. That's obviously not a bad problem. But in the long term, if a child is trained to not void regularly, they're eventually going to develop things like UTIs. And in the worst cases, things like dilatation, they could be constipated. They might have an ectopic bladder, which is often very difficult to find on examination because it's ectopic, but it still tends to be subcutaneous. Um, they could have too much caffeine or chocolate. Some of your artificial colouring agents cause uh, increased urine frequency. They could be psychogenic. They could have diabetes. So your same things, you know, they drink a lot of water. They're peeing a lot. Are they very fatigued? And things like spina bif and seizure disorders are more serious and not to be missed. So it's important with spina bifida. That's a really easy one. You examine them. You look for that sort of bump along the back. Often it's not a big sort of, you know, outpouching of spinal tissue. Often it's just a dimple. That is enough to suggest that a child requires imaging, typically an MRI. And things like seizure disorders, it's really easily asked. When your kid is peeing, what are they physically doing? Because if the answer is they're freezing and going blank and then peeing, that's probably not enuresis. That could be an absence seizure and would need to be treated effectively with I don't know, ethosuximide or something. So those are all worthwhile differentials. So in your OSCE, this is where some of the money is. And the rest of the money is sort of the management. So most kids get better. It's important to assure them that their child is not going to be some 20 year old peeing their pants. Um, you can do moisture alarms where there's a nociceptive response to the ears at least when the child pees their pants. Um, some children I've seen this made have things where it causes like a little bit of a shock. That's probably really cruel, but they do it in the States. You can regulate their fluid intake to make sure they're not drinking at odd times in the day, bladder training, star charts, the sort of just stuff you do to make kids happy. Pelvic floor exercises if they're over the age of seven, because if it's they're under, they're probably not doing them well. And their medications, typically none of you guys will be talking about starting medications and your OSCE will end with, if it's not working, I'm going to refer you to uh, probably a general pediatrician for enuresis. So angoparesis is a separate, oh, I'm probably moving out of time. I've got some information on angoparesis here, some DDXs, including, again, important stuff like Hirschsprung's lumbosacral neurology that you don't want to miss, but can really easily assess for. And your examination, you know, typically don't do a rectal exam because it's uncomfortable and awful and parents will hate you, but you can if you need to. And the pathophysiology is not complex and written that. Cool. Uh, there's lots of other stuff which you can go through. I was never really taught glomerulonephritis when I was in third year and I kind of had to like ask a renal doctor because I had no idea what was going on. So I've included some slides there. Um, are there any questions? Otherwise I'll pass over to Ben. Yes. So a child who is peeing very regularly, so enuresis is more of a trouble. So let's be honest, if you're six, and you're peeing the bed at night, it's, oh, it's like vaguely embarrassing, I guess, but it's actually not pathological. And uresis is much more about daytime incontinence. But if a child is peeing, you know, at the night, it's reasonable to make them void right before they go to bed. Um, if you want to wake them up four hours in, that'll also help, but you're more likely to instigate a poor sleep pattern. Nocturnal enuresis tends to get better by the age of seven or eight. If it's continuing up until their grade three and four, you know, that's when you start being like a bit worried. Why is my kid and not peeing properly? And that's probably still behavioral as opposed to pathological. Any other? Yes. Hello. Hello. I taught you last year. Hi. <laughs> In what? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so the high gluten diet will get you a nice result, but the problem with that is it's incredibly uncomfortable for the kid. So in, again, in the state, in the UK, they definitely don't encourage a high gluten diet because that increases your risk of all of those other things and also predisposes you to some of those complications we've flagged before. The reality is even in someone who's got really well controlled celiac disease, they will have, like I have friends who have no symptoms for like five, six years, 
they still get scopes, they still have those macroscopic and histological findings. The other reason why you'll do a gluten-free disease, gluten-free diet, is many parents will, at the end of that stage, opt out of the scope. Because they, want, they don't want to expose their child to an invasive procedure with an anesthetic load, which is reasonable, I guess. And if they respond well to a gluten-free diet, then you've at least stopped the problem and can empirically treat a celiac. You don't have to biopsy. It's nice, but you can do all of the things, folate monitoring, iron monitoring, without actually having a biopsy. So gluten-free diet is often a way of empirically testing that, and many parents won't want to scope at the end of that anyway. Cool. Any other questions? All right. Thanks, everyone. The slides are up. There won't be a post-lecture slide because I haven't changed anything. And I'll hand over to Ben. Thank you.